So uh, let's go ahead and get started. Uh, I'm really excited about this uh, presentation from Dr. Steve Roche. He is an expert in color genetics. Uh, he has both a, the basic color genetics or introduction to rabbit color genetics that will be in this video, uh, but they're also check out the advanced color genetics uh, video that he did, uh, which has a lot of great information in it as well. Uh, Steve is uh, an expert within the industry on color genetics, having uh, been a speaker at many, many events across the last 50 years on color genetics. And uh, I'm really excited about uh, diving into this topic. Go ahead, Steve. Uh, thank you, David. Okay, we're going to uh, talk about rabbit coat color genetics, and I'm going to start out pretty basic. So if some of you have a familiarity, bear with me at least for the first eight or 10 slides, because I'm going to talk about uh, basically where we're, uh, what we're, I'm going to use nomenclature that you have to understand as I move into this. But let's start with asking ourselves, why are you here? Well, maybe you're just new to the hobby. I've met a lot of people over the last few weeks and shows I've gone to that uh, have said, this is my first show, which is kind of surprising. So you may be new to the hobby and somebody told you, you need to know color genetics. Maybe uh, you thought you used to know it, you just want to recall it and have a refresher, and that's good too. Maybe there's a know-it-all that's been telling you everything about rabbit genetics, and you don't think they're really all that good, and you want to prove to them that they don't know it all. And maybe uh, I just want some genetic terms so I don't sound stupid. So whatever your reason is here, uh, I'm here to help you, and I'm more than happy to do that. Uh, we're going to overview the next hour starting with terms that you might know, you might need to know uh, when you're talking to somebody about rabbit coat color. Uh, we're gonna talk about how the genes are actually transferred. We're gonna talk about gene notation and shorthand, the basic five color series, and then the color rules for rabbit coat colors. And this, you don't have to know any of the color series or anything to know the rules. And that's where we're gonna to get toward the end and be done. So I hope this fits in with what you're looking at this rabbit show presentation for, and uh, hoping that you will hope that you will end up in the next hour being much more knowledgeable. Let's start with, first of all, two terms that you need to know, phenotype and genotype. Uh, we're gonna give some samples of those. Uh, by the way, I'll say it now and I'll say it again. Uh, Phenotype, as you can see by this flamingo, it's what you see, phenotype, as opposed to genotype, which is what causes what you see to be there. This is the stuff that we don't have microscopes, and this is the stuff that, that uh, you're just going to have to trust that uh, uh, the equations are going to work out for you. We're going to calculate possibilities. I'm going to tell you a quick, easy way to figure out how many potential different phenotypes you might be able to get out of a couple of other of the rabbits that you breed. We're gonna talk about the impact of recessives and we're gonna say, what do I get if I cross certain things? Uh, the impact of recessives I'm gonna get into in just a minute because right now, if you're really, really basic, you're saying, I don't even know what a recessive is. So explain that to me before I get to the impact. So let's do that. Let's start with genotype. Genotype is the genetic code for the colors. This is called a Punnett square right here. And we're going to uh, talk about that a little bit later. Phenotype is the color of the rabbit. Here's a lot of different colors, a lot of different varieties. Uh, we've got, you know, mini lops and we've got uh, Harlequins, and we've got some Dutch and a lot of different things. But of course, you know, there are over 55 breeds now, so I, I'm not representing all of them. I think it's important that you know the difference between homozygous and heterozygous pairs. So I'll get into in the next couple of slides that genes come in pairs. But just remember this, homozygous, the word itself means that both genes are the same. I'll tell you what they are in a few minutes, but heterozygous means the pair are different. 
Now, this is important for you to understand. Homozygous, put that word in your vocabulary. Homozygous means where that pair of genes is to express, and I'll explain what those are in to express pattern or color or shading, uh, all those different things. There's only two genes at that location. And if they're the same gene, whether it's a little a, little a, big A, big A, or whatever, they're called homozygous. Homo meaning the same. Hetero meaning they are different. This is gonna have some bearing here in just a few minutes. Okay, I talked about the fact that recessive, but I didn't mention dominant. So genes generally come in what are called dominant and recessive genes. Now, that's not necessarily true for all cases, but let's understand that in most cases, dominant means whenever that gene is present, that trait's going to be shown. If it's recessive, it usually only impacts the color when the two recessive genes are together. If you look to the right just quickly, let's talk about for just a second and look closely. Let's pretend this is eye color. I tried to put these as close to looking like eyes as I could. If dad has brown eyes, whether it's rabbits or people, whatever, and mom has blue eyes, if dad is dominant brown, that means all the kids are going to have brown eyes, even if mom has blue eyes, okay? She's recessive. If he's homozygous, term we just used for brown, and she's homozygous, which she would have to be if she had blue, because remember, uh, recessive genes only show themselves if they are homozygous. So this is a litter of dilute rabbits. That means, and I'll get to this in a minute, just bear with me, but this means they all carry recessive dilution genes. Now there's something called incomplete dominance. An incomplete dominance doesn't fully exhibit its trait. As David said in the introduction, if you would, if you would uh, bear with me getting through this presentation, I go into a lot of detail in the advanced coat color genetics presentation about the incomplete dominance, especially in the C series. Let's talk about what is a purebred. A purebred is an animal who transmits similar appearance to each generation. Here's a nice litter of Dutch, just to tell you. Uh, you know, that's they, the parents transmitted their appearance to all of these babies. These are apparently pure bred. In other words, the parents are pure for Dutch, both of them. And so the babies end up being pure for Dutch. Again, uh, not to be marketing, but if you, when you get into the advanced class, which is another set, not this one, uh, of genetics, uh, I will go into immense detail about how the Dutch genes work. Anyway, inbred is a term that you should know. Purebred animals can be inbred, many of them are, when closely related rabbits are bred together, usually this locks in traits. You know, you might breed an uncle to a niece or, or uh, other, you know, closely bred animals. And when you do that in rabbits, you generally lock in traits. Understand, this is truly your introduction into genetics. By the time we get done with this presentation, you'll be speaking a new language by the time we're all done. So uh, again, you may wanna to listen to this presentation two or three or four or more times to get these locked in, but understand you're about to learn a language that you probably didn't know before. Let's talk about color genes and how they're transferred. Now this is basic genetics. And what we're talking about is genes. Okay, a gene is not something you can see. A gene is a combination of material, biological material, that actually directs how we're gonna look and often how we're gonna act because certain genes drive certain things. We're only talking in this presentation about rabbit coat color genetics. I am very specific in using that term a lot. So a gene, 
drives what the rabbit's coat color is going to look like. Phenotype, remember phenotype. Phenotype is always exhibited due to a pair of a pair of genes. All right, a pair. Now, when you get to the advanced class, I will be talking about a modifier called Rufus, which I'm not going to talk about here, but that has uh, six uh, modifying genes in it. Uh, but in each case, only half can possibly be transmitted. Don't go there yet. I'll get into a lot of detail when you go to that presentation. But phenotype traits are always exhibited due to two, a pair of two genes. However, understand that each individual pair may or may not impact the appearance. Remember, we just talked about dominant and recessive. If they're dominant, they will show. If they're recessive, they won't unless they are homozygous, which means there are two of that recessive. And here's an example for you. Again, let's talk about eyes, but this time, instead of the example I used two slides ago, where I had dad be homozygous for, for, for brown eyes, in this case, let's pretend that would be this one right here, but let's pretend that dad is carrying a blue recessive. In other words, maybe dad has brown eyes, but his mom had blue and his dad had brown. So he ends up showing brown, but he carries a recessive for blue. So given that, let's say that mom is the same way. Mom's brown eyes, but she carries a recessive for blue. Well, then if you look at this, what's called a Punnett square, not that you need to remember that, but there are four opportunities for eye color in their, in their offspring. If the mother gives a dominant brown and dad gives a dominant brown, then their kids will be pure homozygous brown eyes. If mother gives a B and dad gives a chocolate or a, a brown, uh, then we're going to have the brown show, but they're going to carry that blue. If you look in the lower right, let's assume that mom gives a recessive blue and dad gives a recessive blue. That means the offspring is going to have blue eyes. And if you do the math, there are four squares here. You're going to see that 75% of the time, the offspring of these two people will have brown eyes. And only 25% of the time will these babies have blue eyes. If the parents are both heterozygous, again, I'm using terms I want you to get used to. If the parents are both heterozygous and carry that recessive, the odds are one out of four that they're going to have blue eyes. It doesn't mean that they won't have maybe four kids and they'll all be blue eyed. That could happen. But over time, statistically, the odds are 75%, 25%. Again, talking about these genes and how they are transferred. Let's talk about eggs and sperm. We're talking about mammals now and specifically rabbits. Egg and sperm, they contain a random mix of just half of all the genes that made the parent look as it did. A parent has two genes that determine how they look, but they can only pass on one of these. Each parent passes on one so the offspring ends up with how many? Well, two, because that's what we all have. So the parents can only give half of the genes, okay? Thus, when we're talking about this, since they can only donate one of the two genes for any trait, any trait, then the offspring get a random mix. We just really don't know what's gonna be tossed out there. The simple example, and I'll go into this in detail for a couple of slides, the simple example would be of gene transfer to whether you are a boy or a girl. So uh, each parent can only give an X or a Y. And mom can only give an X. I'll talk about this in just a second. But note that a zygote, that's the developing baby rabbit, has got to get some of, some of the genes from the egg and some of the genes from the sperm. Okay, now we use letters to represent these traits. Listen to me carefully for just a second. It really doesn't matter what letter we use, as long as everybody accepts that it means the same thing. 
as far as the sex of the rabbit goes or people, X and Y are the letters that we humans have accepted to represent the difference between the sexes. Now it could have been A and B, but it wasn't. It was X and Y in this case. So we merely need to know the genetic code rules to speak with each other about genetics. So we've all accepted that X and Y is what we're talking about. X could have been A, Y could have been B, but they aren't. So let's go on and talk about how we use letters to represent traits. Well, first of all, it's generally accepted by everyone that talks about genetics that the two genes that represent a girl are X and X. The ones that, that go together make the female's genetic code XX. It is usually accepted that the two genes that represent a boy are X and Y, making the male's genetic code as XY. If you look over here on the right, you'll see if the sperm brings an X and the egg has an X, the result is a female. If the sperm brings a Y and the female only has an X, then it's XY and that's a male. Did you notice that the sperms can have X or Y because males are X or Y? Did you notice that the female can only have X's because XX is a term for female? I think it's important to understand this. So let's go, the male gene, a male is represented by XY. One gene came from the mother, and one gene came from the father. If it is a male, where did the X gene come from? Well, since the mother only has X's, that's where it came from. The father, since the father was a male, XY, he can only give an X or a Y. Only one of them, not both. The odds are 50-50. And X or Y will be given when the offspring is conceived. So if you look at this drawing over here, 50% of the time, it's an X, 50% it's a Y. In other words, it's a coin toss, right? So what we're saying is that while the mother can give X, X only, the father can give an X or a Y. Now, a female is XX. I've mentioned this three times now. One X gene came from the mother, and one X came from the father. Since the mother is a female XX, she can only give X genes. Thus, she can only contribute to making a, another female by giving it X. The odds are 50-50, I just showed you that, which gene will be given. But since they're both X's from mom, the odds are 100% that the female will provide an X gene. So if the male gives an X gene, what sex will the baby be? Well, it will be female. If the male gives a Y gene, what sex will the baby be? Well, it'll be an XY. I think this is important for you to listen to carefully. Since the sex of the baby, the female can only give an X. The male can give either an X or a Y. Listen carefully. The sex of any animal any mammal for sure, is always determined by what the male contributes. The male contributes an X, it's a female. If they contribute a Y, it's a male. So the sex of any mammal for sure is always determined by the father. Guaranteed 100%. Now we go back to our, our uh, shorthand again. If you can accept that we assign these letters, to represent traits, and we all agree what these letters are, we can then speak the genetic shorthand. We can use uppercase and lowercase. Uppercase indicates dominant, lowercase indicates recessive. Just as the example I used earlier, here's the blue eyes, and see the lowercase b as opposed to the uppercase b. Uppercase are dominant, lowercase are recessive. Think of blue eyes as always recessive and brown eyes as dominant, even if they're, let's go back to your language lesson, even if they're heterozygous. Heterozygous meaning they are not the same. Brown eyed people may, and you can't tell by looking at them, uh, 
They may be heterozygous, they may be homozygous. Let's talk about shorthand a minute. Now, I don't expect you to know anything that's going on here. This is just an example of shorthand. Within our 10 series of basic rabbit genes, there are as many as five different indices or indicators to differentiate subtle and not so subtle differences. I'm going to explain the five series and I'm going to shame, uh, explain how many different subsets there are in each. I'm going to try to not have you swallow the elephant hole here, so to speak. It takes practice to learn any type of this shorthand. And this is indeed shorthand. Okay? So it's common to read and read these notations over and over to learn what you may have to know. Just like, and I don't know shorthand, I copied this up here, but the people that know shorthand have memorized all of these different codes. This is what we're going to talk about, and you're going to be able to memorize the different codes that we have for our rabbit genetics. Now, finally, after all these slides, we're going to actually be talking about rabbit coat color. Okay, I hope that's, that's to your liking. The coat color traits we want to label are patterns. And there are three of those. We use these letter codes for those three. A big A, remember that means it's dominant. An A sub T, which is in the middle. And then the smallest A, which is recessive. Three patterns. So we wanna talk about, think about a rabbit's coat. And there are five things that actually give you the appearance of what that color is. There are two base colors. We're using B and little b, B being dominant. I'll explain all these to you in immense detail in a couple of minutes. There are five, what are called yellow levels. I'll explain that to you in a second, but they are these five. And I'm not gonna go into that because I'm gonna go into it in detail and show you, show you examples. There is intensity and dilution. There are only two indices at this, at this gene series. Each of these is called a series. Three is a series, two is a series, five is a series, two is a series. And then we have what are called extension factors, and there are four of those. So you can see that we have our own shorthand for each of these. And what I'm going to do during this presentation is explain each of these, give you a phenotype example, and talk about how these are going to work to your advantage in understanding rabbit coat color. Let's talk about the color pattern, which is the A series. I mentioned that the three patterns in A are presented in order of dominance and the most recessive is the little A. So the BA is a agouti. Now, here's a picture of a agouti. When you blow into an agouti rabbit, look what's unusual. You would think the color would be the same from the very bottom where it grows out of the rabbit all the way to the end, but that's not the case. An agouti simply means that there are at least three colors and sometimes four and sometimes more, at least three colors on the same hair shaft. And you can see that. If you were to pluck a hair out of this particular picture, you would see that the bottom has slate blue. In the center, there is some pearl or off-white. And then you can see there might be some some black or chocolate, and then some white ticking. A sub T is tan pattern. A tan pattern has a solid body area and accent colors. Here are two examples. This is a tan rabbit. This is a silver martin Nettleland dwarf. What I want you to notice is that it's not a goodie. You blow into these, the color goes all the way to the bottom. But uh, whether the surface color is black or chocolate or blue, we'll get to that in a minute. The tan pattern has a solid body color and accent colors. This is called tan pattern, okay? And the most recessive is A. And to see it, you have to have two recessive A's. It's a solid. Most common thing you're probably gonna see, a solid color 
has the same color on the entire body, including the feet and the tail. And when you blow into it, you generally have that same color all the way to the bottom, like up here at the top. It's not a number of different colors on the hair shaft. It is solid, like black in this case, all the way down. So this is the A series. These are the patterns. A rabbit is either going to be a goody, solid, or tan pattern. Now you're gonna say, well, I've seen some that are shaded or other colors. Yes, that's true. And I'll talk about that when we get to the extension series. The last series, this one is recessive only. Remember the term again, homozygous. So homozygous, two of the same recessive A's. So that's the A series. Now we have the B series. Now this one is one that confuses some folks and I don't want it to. So accept that what I'm telling you is accepted by all the breeders that understand coat color genetics. There are only two colors represented in this, the dominance. There's a big B and a little B. This is our B series. Now, please accept there are only two colors of rabbit. Only two. Any color that doesn't appear to be these two colors really is the color. It's just a modification of these two colors. Black. This is the dominant base color. Black. Recessive bees are chocolate or brown. Uh, this is the recessive color. The series is recessive only when you see this. When you see a chocolate rabbit, understand there is no black gene there. Now, this black rabbit could carry a recessive chocolate gene. Maybe its father was black and its mother was chocolate. It still turns out to be black because it's a heterozygous big B, little b. Okay, but if anybody says how many rabbits are colors are there, truth is, if you want to talk about actual, not phenotype, but genotype, there's only black and chocolate. Now, what impacts those black or chocolates? Well, we're at the C series now. This one is more complex. This series is not well understood. I go into immense detail in the advanced genetics presentation, which is another slide set. But this series is not well understood by most people, but I want you to not be most people. It includes dominant genes and incomplete dominant genes, as well as the strongest recessive gene of any series. And I'm going to explain that to you. So let's, let's work with this. Basic information, each hair shaft, if you can think of it this way, is painted with yellow along the entire length. And then there's black or chocolate on top of that. Accept this, please, uh, and life will be a lot easier for you. I don't know how or why that happened, but that's basically it. So the C-series may or may not remove yellow from the hair shaft in varying degrees. Some genes in the C-series remove more than just yellow. So let's start with the fact that we're talking about five different impacts or indices in the C. Full yellow doesn't change any appearance. Okay, this rabbit, nice as it is, has, has a full color. You're saying, well, that doesn't look black. Well, no, it's not black, obviously. But trust me when I say that this is a full C, capital C at the C index. It has full color. CCHD is the second most powerful uh, in, in, a, in a heterozygous context. It's called chinchilla. And the CHD actually stands for dark chin. This isn't dark but you'll see what I mean in the next one. Chinchilla removes all yellow, all yellow. Do you see any yellow on this rabbit? No, you don't. 
Why not? Because the yellow has been erased by the dark chinchilla gene. Now, if indeed this rabbit were genetically a capital C with the CCHD, remember there can only be two at the C point. There's five that exist, but there can be only two placeholders. So this rabbit up here could be a capital C and then a CCHD as the second gene. But you don't see that because the full C is dominant over the CCHD. This rabbit is CCHD. So there's no full C here. This could be CCHD, CCHD. It could be CCHD and any of the lower or less impactful C series genes, which we're moving into. But notice there is no yellow on a chinchilla because the CCHD gene erases yellow. Now let's talk about, uh, as we move on, remember both dominant and incomplete dominant. So the next one is called the CCHL, C -C -H -L, light chin, light chin. It removes some yellow, but it leaves black or brown. This is called a seal. A seal is uh, CCHL and it's CCHL. So this is the middle. In other words, we have the full C, the CCHD, and then the CCHL. The fourth is what's called a CH. H, you can, if you want to remember it easy, Himalayan, if you know what a Himalayan rabbit is, or a Californian. It removes all color, all color including the eyes, but not the extremities. So you look at the back legs, look at the front legs, look at the nose, look at the ears. These are all extremities to the core bit of the rabbit. So the CH gene as the dominant gene erases all color, including the eyes, which is why they have pink eyes. What you're looking at there is not actually a color. What you're looking at is through the iris, through the retina of the rabbit, to actually the blood that is in the back of that eye, okay? This series is not well understood. Remember I talked about complete dominance and, and recessive dominance. And now we get to this very, very strong, the fifth in the series, it's recessive C, little c, little c. It removes all color from all areas, including it. Now listen, all color from all areas. Here you see a, a uh, white at the top. It's a very nicely typed animal. And at the bottom, you see an other one dwarf that's white. They all have pink eyes. Remember, it moves all color from all areas, including the eyes. This series has the recessive gene only being visible when the gene pair is homozygous. Again, I keep wanting you to use the terms heterozygous and homozygous. So here we've got these whites. Now, in the advanced series, I go into immense detail about what could be within these, and I show you how to, to breed a couple to test. But for today, accept that white CC means that no matter what other genes are, the A series, the B series, the D series, or the E series, if this little CC is there, it eliminates the phenotype of any of those. So the phenotype, when you have a recessive C, recessive C is always white and it's always a red-eyed white. Dilution, we've gone through A, B, and C. The dilution series has, uh, in, in this particular case, has two things can happen. It can either be intense or it can be dilute. It's a confusing name. I understand that because when we call it dilution, it refers to the recessive gene and not to the dominant gene. In other words, the capital D is intense. The little d is, is recessive. For instance, you see here two Dutch. The one on the right is black. The one on the left is blue. At the B series, which you're already familiar with, these are both capital B with something else. In other words, they are dominant 
for black. So blue is actually a black rabbit that is diluted by the, the two little D genes that are there. Chocolate dilute is lilac. Here you see two chocolates and a lilac. So again, at the B series, these are recessive B, recessive B, all of them. But at the D series, this one has two small Ds, recessive. If we want to talk just a little bit further, on the left, you see what we call a castor agouti in Rex. This is a black rabbit, but it's a goody, which is why it looks like this. What is the dilute? The dilute is an opal. An opal is simply a diluted little d, little d, caster. Changes the appearance totally, but they're both basically black rabbits that have been impacted by modifying genes. Okay, that's the D series. So now we have what's called the E series. Again, uh, uh, before I leave the D series, D is the intense. It allows black as black and brown as brown. But remember, if you have that secondary gene, there's always two. That secondary gene is a, is a recessive D. It doesn't matter. It still is an intense animal. It just carries that recessive. Little D, little D obviously is dilute. Black is blue. Brown or chocolate is lilac. Again, genetically, except for the, except for the D series, uh, these are basically the same color animal. I'm sorry, now we'll get to the E series. Okay, this series impacts how the base color moves along a hair shaft. Say, well, what do you mean? Well, let me refer you back to the A series. Do you remember the agouti? What did it do? It divided the hair shaft into three or four or five different colors. Well, at the E series, it also impacts. There are four genes in the series. And the most dominant is actually incompletely dominant. In order of dominance, the first two are the steel and the full extension or black. I want you to look on the right here. Steel is the most dominant. I will go into detail in the advanced class about how you can kind of play with these a little bit. But understand that the steel, which is often hidden, that's why I say it's incompletely dominant. It doesn't always impact itself. But this gene creates tipping on the ends up here. Okay? So this is just a black animal that's got tipping as opposed to the bottom one, which is full extension, which means that there is no uh, movement along that hair shaft. So ES is the most dominant. E is the next, as I just talked about. There's one called EH, and H stands for Harlequin or mosaic. It creates a patchwork. There's actually no formula. It's very, I raised Harlequins for years, and you just can't predict when you cross two parents what patterns the young ones are going to have. Uh, this is not an acceptable variety, but I love the picture. This is a Harlequin Dutch. Isn't that beautiful? Uh, they have those in Europe. They don't have them in the United States yet. This is called a Japanese harlequin. You see the split on the head. They have bands or bars along the back. And this is another harlequin. See the pattern. But let me ask you a question. As you look at these two, the last two, what's the difference? The difference is the bottom one has no yellow. Think back to what you just learned from the C series. What does the C series do? The C series erases yellow. So if you were to erase all the yellow in this animal, you would get something like this. So what does that tell you about just looking at this? It's called a magpie. That's called a Japanese. This is called a magpie. What does this tell you when there's no yellow? It tells you that while it has the EH gene for this mosaic pattern, it also must have the dominant CCHD gene at the C series, at the C series, which erases yellow. So now you know when you look at Harlequins at a show, the Japanese 
are full color, big C, but these have to have a chinchilla gene because there's no yellow. Now you're starting to become a coat color genetic detective. The series impacts how base color moves along a hair. Okay, and now we get to the most recessive. Remember, recessives are generally only shown, except in that C series, when they're in their homozygous form. So if we take a black rabbit and we have two recessive E's, boy, does it impact how the base color moves. Tort is an excellent example. Here are three tort rabbits. Look at them. Would you believe me? And I hope you do when I tell you these are actually black animals. They are black, all three of them. But they have the recessive EE in the E series, which causes the color to not move along the hair shaft very much at all. Where there's shorter fur, like on the nose, like on the feet, like on the tips of the ears, more, uh, it's called non-extension. In other words, the black color does not extend. The double E's, meaning it's a non-extended rabbit, which means that back here where the coat's long, the black doesn't extend all the way out. Doesn't extend all the way out here, doesn't extend all the way out here. But where the coat is short, shorter around the muzzle, around the feet, around the muzzle, the ears, that's where there's not much extension to happen. So that's why you see them darker. The black actually can't be moved along the hair shaft because the hair shaft is so short. So that's the E series. Now let's talk, uh, those, are the, those are the five basic ones. When we get to the advanced class, I will talk about other genes and, and some things that are a little more sophisticated. But for our purposes today, absolute color rules. You don't need to know A, B, C, D, E to understand these rules. All rabbits are either black or chocolate, okay? That's a rule. You can quote that and you will be right every time, even though they don't look that way. They look at a blue, you say, no, it's not black, it's blue. Well, it's black. It's just genetically diluted. Now you're starting to use your nomenclature or the words that you're learning from this presentation. Dilute, bred to dilute is always dilute. You are never going to breed a dilute to a dilute and get an intense rabbit. Solid to solid is always solid. Okay, now it may not look, per se, uh, the offspring may not look solid, but they are, but there may be some modifying genes. Chocolate bred to chocolate is always chocolate. You can never get a black or a blue animal out of chocolate bread to chocolate. You can't do it because why? Because it's two little bees. There's no big bee anywhere in the mix. So chocolate bread to chocolate is always chocolate. Now, tort bread to tort is always tort. White bread to white is always white. But if one of them is a blue eyed white, it's not going to be. I won't touch this for now. It's a little more complex as it was something called a Vienna gene. And again, in your advanced genetics presentation, we'll get into the details here. But bright bread to white is almost always white. Certainly, red-eyed white to red-eyed white is always red-eyed white. You absolutely cannot get a broken from two solids. And white is not always a solid. In other words, if you want solids, you can breed a solid down here to a broken and you will get brokens. I go into that in immense detail too with the EN gene in the advanced presentation, but not today, except to understand you cannot get a broken from two solids. But when I say white is not always a solid, now years ago, I had a beautiful white rabbit, but I knew that she was actually, when, remember, the white is caused by the eraser, recessive C, recessive C. But I knew when she had babies, if I bred her to a solid, she had brokens, which meant she actually carried the broken gene, even though you couldn't see it because it was erased because of the little c, little c. Okay, phenotypes and their genotypes. We've got an agouti rabbit here, 
Okay, what is the phenotype? Black agouti. We call it black agouti. It's the most common color. What is the genotype? Well, it could be almost anything. It's wild rabbit color. It's the most dominant. In other words, we know there's a capital A, a capital B, a capital C, a capital D, and a capital E. We know that it's agouti. It's black. It's got full color. It is not dilute. It's intense. And it's got the E. It's, it's not a steel. It's an agouti. But it's got full color expression. This is the most common. And it doesn't matter. See the question marks? It doesn't matter in the string of five which one is, is uh, uh, the second. It could be an AT. It could be a little A. It could be a big A. Uh, you know the, the, the five indices now. So you know the second could be anything from homozygous, two big Ds, two big Es, or anything heterozygous. But as long as these are dominant and in place, that's the genotype, but it could be many different genotypes. What is the phenotype? Go back to your language lesson. Phenotype is what it looks like. This one is white. What is the genotype? What series erases color? I just mentioned it. Remember, it's the little c. So it really doesn't matter if the animal were originally a goody or tan pattern or solid, whether it was chocolate or whether it was black whether it was fully diluted or whether it was not, whether it was, I mean, it could even be a harlequin. Doesn't matter. Those two little C's erase what? All color. So we don't know what any of the rest of these are when we have a white. The only thing we know by looking at the genotype is that it's two recessive C's. What is the phenotype of this? Well, we would call this a chocolate silver martin. Well, what does that mean to you? Remember what we said about the chinchilla gene and what does it erase? It erases yellow. If you have a tan rabbit or if you have an otter rabbit, they don't have white tips because they don't have the chin gene. What's the genotype? What would you guess? Remember there are five levels, pattern, color, yellow, intensity, an extension. So what we know looking at this silver martin is that it does have a CCHD, no yellow. It's a tan pattern, so it's got to be AT, and it's chocolate, so it's got to be BB, recessive. It's not, it's not uh, a dilute. In other words, it's not a lilac. So we know there's a capital D here, and then it is not a non-extension. There's no shading. Uh, it's not a harlequin, so we don't see any steel, so it's got to be a full E. So just by looking at this animal, given what you now know, you know that a chocolate silver martin is basically these five. You can take that to the bank. Now let's take a look. What do we got here? What's the phenotype? Okay, we know it's a lilac. So if it is What's the gene type? Is it solid, black or chocolate, diluted or intense? Well, you know, looking at it, that it's solid. So it's recessive A. You know that it's a chocolate, recessive Bs. It's full color because it's not got white. It's not chin. It's not light chin. Is it a dilute? Well, sure, it's a dilute. It's a lilac. It's a diluted chocolate. So you've got the BB and the DD. And is it full color? Well, it's not Harlequin. It's not steel. Uh, it's not non-extension. So it's got to be a capital E in the first place. So now your detective work has paid off and you know what a lilac is genetically when you look at the phenotype. Now we've got one. Sometimes the phenotype isn't clear. Different breeds have different names. Okay, what's the phenotype? Seal point? Some breeds may call it that. Maybe it's a chocolate California. Maybe it's a chocolate seal point. Maybe it's a chocolate Siamese. What is the genotype? We just don't know. We do know it's solid. We think that it's probably 
uh, and we know that it's solid, we know that it's pretty much chocolate, okay? But it could be, uh, and this one right here, uh, you can pretty much erase. We know it could be CCHL, which is the seal, remember? Not dark chin, but it could be a somewhat quasi-colored chin. And what this would do is to dilute, if this was actually black, this could actually make it look brown. Seal, right? Okay, we know that it's not dilute because you can look at it and see it's not lilac and it's not blue. So we know there's a capital D here. And then it could be non-extension or it could be full extension, but have the uh, Himalayan gene here. So you see what I mean? Sometimes we just don't know, but in two examples before, we do know. Okay, how many genotypes can there be? We're not just restricting you to only the five that we're talking about in this presentation. How many genes are there and how many pairs? We've only covered the basic five coat color gene series. There are six or seven or eight that we know of, and there are many more that we don't know of. But recall that they are easily recalled as alphabet designators. Isn't that nice? A, B, C, D, things you've known since first grade. So what we're talking about is how many genotypes can there be? Well, in each series, let's refresh. A had three. So that means there's six different pairs. Look here. Six different pairs. Two, B, uh, the B series black or brown, have two genes. So there's three different pairs. Big B, little B, <coughs> I'm sorry, big B, big B, I made a typo here, and little B, okay? Five in the C series. So there's 15 different pairs. D had two, so again, there's three. And E had four, so there's 10 different pairs, and that's these you see right here. All right, so now we've got some math to do. If you multiply them together, how many pairs can there possibly be? Six at A, three at B, 15 at C, three at D, and 10 at E. If you calculate those together, it's 8,100 possible genotypes. That's just for these five. And we're not counting others. 8,100 possible genotypes. So if there's 8,100 possible genotypes, how many different phenotypes or colors might there be? Well, you know by now that a particular appearing rabbit can have lots of different genotypes and still have the same appearance. So this math is the same way. Pattern A, A series has three. Okay, we're not talking about pairs now. We're talking about appearance. B has two. Five in the yellow removal, two in dilution, and four in genes. This should be second nature to you now. So if we do that mass, we multiply three times two times five times two times four, and it's 240. So what we're talking about is out of 8,100 different genotypes, there could be only 240 appearing rabbits. So look at all the genotypes you could have and still only have 240 phenotypes. 240. So why are there fewer phenotypes than genotypes? Well, you know that. Genes are available in pairs. Any recessive gene usually doesn't impact the phenotype. Recessive genes don't impact the phenotype unless they are, what's the word? Homozygous. Then they fully impact it. Thus, many of the genotypes can occur and the phenotype is still unaffected. What's the phenotype of these genotypes? Okay, let's take a look here. What do we got? We got a tan pattern. We've got black, looking at the first only. In this particular one, we've got full color. In this particular one, we've got full dilution. In this one, we have full expression. The genotypes look different, but both phenotypes are actually black otters. No chin. Right? So they are not silver martin. Can't be. You look closely at this, there's tan there. There's a little bit of tan here. If you roll it over, there's tan margins. So this, they are black otters. 
but their genotypes are different. Why? The recessives in the first rabbit have no impact on the phenotype. This is all homozygous, right? Same, 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 same. These are heterozygous. Heterozygous, heterozygous, heterozygous. heterozygous. Okay, you with me? No impact. That's why there are more genotypes than phenotypes. Let's talk about the impact of recessive genes for just a second. Okay, they can make a lot of difference. Everything here is a black rabbit. They're all homozygous, okay? But what if we have recessive genes? Let's start with this. All we do is change these two to recessive and we get a chocolate, everything else being the same. And this one, all we do is change the Ds to recessive. So it changes the black to a blue. On this one, if we change the E to two non-extension, we get tort. If we change this one and we get rid of the Bs and the Ds and make recessives, we get lilac. If we want a blue tort, again, see the only, see these are dominant. We're still leaving the first two always as a solid color rabbit. No agoutis, no tan pattern. So what we've got here is the BB. So what you've got now is a blue tort. Tort because of the EE, DD because the black is now diluted. A lilac tort, what do we do? Well, we change the capital Bs to recessive Bs, leave the full color in there, but go dilute and non-extension. Aha, uh -huh. this black ends up not being a black, it ends up being a white, because of the two recessive C genes. This black ends up being a hemi because at the C series, we have CHCH. So you would probably call this a Californian. And then finally, the blast black, if we just take the C series and make it CCH double CCHL, then we are looking at a seal. And as an aside, and I'll go into this in the advanced class, if this were a CCHL with a C, it wouldn't be a seal, it would be a sable. But you'll see pictures of that in the advanced class. Okay, the other five color gene series, well, there are actually more than five, but there's English, there's Dutch, there's wide band, there's silver, which has to do with silver, champagne, silver fox, uh, cream de argents, and then there's the Vienna genes. We aren't talking about any of those here today. The major impact is this. All rabbits have these genes, even though you say, well, it's not a sore, it's not a Dutch. Yes, but there are placeholders. And I'll go into that at the beginning of the advanced series. These genes are not expressed if they are, for instance, the broken, if it's EN, EN, that's not a broken, that's the placeholders. They're not Dutch, that's the placeholders. They're not wide band, that's the placeholder. They're not silver. Those are the placement. They're not Vienna. They have these in the places. So the places are always for every rabbit. And I'll start out the advanced class explaining this even more. The actual genotype. So what is the phenotype? Pretty straightforward. Black rabbit. What is the genotype? Chances are really good. And let's get beyond our, our A, B, C, D, E for a minute. We still have E, N, E, N. See, those are out there. You just don't see it. It's not a broken. It's not a Dutch. It's not a wide band that we can see. It's not a silver and it's not a Vienna or a blue eyed white. So while we've only talked, stop right here today, uh, after the E, all these others are still there in every rabbit. So what do I get if I cross a what? A black with a white. Well, who knows? Because why? because the white is an unknown. Remember I said it could be tan pattern, it could be a goody, it could be anything. A black with a hemi, I know we're gonna get black. A black with a chin, since the black is, let's say, homo. remember the big word I used up here, what if I cross, assume homozygous, assume homozygous. So this black is black, black. In other words, big B, big B, so, 
even with a chin coming in, we assume that this black was a full C, big C, big C, this will not impact it. So you still get castor or agouti because the chin does carry the agouti, capital A, and the black only carries the little a. A black with a tan, we're gonna get otters. A chin with a hemi, we're gonna get chins because CCHD is higher in the hierarchy than CH. A chin with an otter, you're gonna get castor or sandy agouti because the chin is agouti, the otter is a T. So a T is not higher than a. A silver marten with an otter, you're always gonna get otter because the full color is going to cover up the chin. And a blue with a lilac, you're always gonna get blue because a lilac is little b, little b. And the blue comes in with a capital B, which is a BB, which is dominant over the blue. So just again, assuming heterozygous, now, phenotype and genotype puzzles. You'd think through many gene questions, quiz, this is your test. What's the visual difference between these two rabbits? I've already talked to you about this. Do you recall? What's the visual difference? It's the color. What's the, okay. So what's the difference genetically between these two rabbits? What gene series removes yellow? I'm surely confident that you know. What gene removes all yellow? What gene series removes yellow? So the series, okay. Japanese harlequin, which you just saw, has what color for yellow? Full color. Magpie is CCHD, CCHD. So the chilla gene does what? It removes yellow. The phenotype is always governed by the genotype. The appearance is always covered, governed by the genes that exist. So my final comment to you is this. Understanding nomenclature is just the start of your education. Understanding these five genes is just the beginning, but it's a great start. I would strongly suggest that you now take a look at the Rabbit Show Complex Presentation on Advanced Coat Color Genetics. I wish you all well in your quest for more rabbit knowledge. It's for me over the last 50 years has been one of the most fun things other than competing and judging and, and going to conventions and all the neat stuff with all the people that there are. But this coat color genetics has been something obviously passion for me. And I hope it becomes a passion for you. Good luck to you and bye. Okay. Got her? Yep. This is an incredible presentation and it's why you're an icon within our hobby on, on color genetics. I mean, seeing this presentation on the, the, the introduction to color genes as well as the advanced one. I mean, and just, just so in depth and, and so logical on how you explain it. I really appreciate you on how you explained it. Um, Great. I do have a couple of questions. Yeah. Um, so it, so one of the things that uh, people always say, well, hey, I ended up getting this litter of X and how do you break it back? So if, if you have a litter of a chestnut, a black otter and a black, what then do you know about the parents? Well, let me make sure I understand the question. Um, you're saying people breed something and they get stuff they didn't expect, but they want to get back to the original? Right, right. So, yeah, well, what I would always tell people is, if you start with a parent that you want to get back to, breed that parent back to the offspring because the chances are good that those offspring, we're dealing probably with recessives, right? So if that's indeed the case, you know that the babies, although they may not look like the recessive parent, they actually carry those recessive genes because all those recessive genes were in in, in uh, recessive pairs, so they're carrying it, read it back to the parent that's carrying the recessives and chances are good, half of them are gonna be what you want. 